We are back for another year making predictions for AQA GCSE Psychology. So just like last year, Laura, our Head of Psychology, has looked at the trends and patterns that have come up in the past. She's done a really thorough analysis of the topics and questions that have appeared in previous exam seasons and has used this to write psychology predicted papers for this year. Follow the link to our website and this will take you to all the predicted papers that we have available. And in addition to this, she's done video walkthroughs of both papers so you can see what a top mark band answer looks like in psychology. These will also talk you through the skills, of course. You'll need to interpret the questions and know how to structure the answers as well. You'll see questions in the same style as those in the exams and be able to unpick what they are actually asking, what needs to be included in your responses and how these should be structured then you'll be ready to do exactly the same in the actual exam. You can get both papers that we've written for this year and all the video walkthroughs in our masterclass, or you can use these topics as a starting point for your revision. Please remember to revise everything as they are just predictions. We don't have any additional information or know anything in advance of the exams. We have not seen the real papers. Okay, so starting with paper one, cognition and behaviour, there are four sections in the paper. That's memory, perception, development and research methods. And we'll go through each of these topics in this video. So first up, memory. Murdoch's serial position curve study. Murdoch's study focused on the primary and recency effect. Make sure you can describe its aim, procedure, findings and conclusion. Be ready to evaluate the study, considering its strengths, limitations and supporting evidence. Then, Bartlett's War of the Ghost Study. Again, this is another key study that is named in the specification, so you know you can get questions specifically about it. Make sure you can describe its aim, procedure, findings, conclusion as well, and be ready with detailed evaluation points. Factors affecting the accuracy of memory, potentially with a focus on false memories. Understand how false memories can affect the accuracy of memory, both positively and negatively. Be prepared to evaluate this theory, considering its strengths and limitations. Next up, we've got perception. Monocular depth cues, so remember that these include relative size, height in plane, linear perspective and occlusion. Make sure you can define each cue and explain how it contributes to depth perception. Be ready to apply this knowledge to scenarios or images, demonstrating how these cues inform our perception of depth. Then, still on perception, you have Gregory's constructivist theory of perception. So be sure you can describe the theory, including how perception involves top-down processing, where the brain interprets sensory information by relying on memory and context. Prepare to evaluate the theory, discussing its strengths, such as explaining perceptual errors like visual illusions, and its limitations like the underestimation of the role of direct sensory input, that's bottom up processing. Then you've got effect of motivation on perceptual set. So focus on how motivation can influence what we perceive, such as when we're hungry, we might perceive ambiguous images as food related. Be ready to explain key studies or examples that illustrate how motivation can alter perception. Prepare to evaluate the effect of motivation on perceptual set, considering its strengths, like providing insight into why people perceive the same stimulus differently and its limitations, such as the difficulty in isolating motivation from other factors influencing perception. Next up, we've got development. So look at Piaget's concepts of assimilation and accommodation. Be prepared to describe these processes with examples and explain how they contribute to cognitive development. Then look at application of Piaget's stages in education. Be sure you can explain how these stages inform educational practices, such as the importance of hands-on learning in the concrete operational stage, or encouraging problem solving and abstract thinking in the formal operational stage. Evaluation of this application should consider how Piaget's theory has influenced educational practices positively, but also address criticisms such as the rigidity of the stages and the individual variability in children's development. Then you've got Hughes' policeman study. Make sure you can describe the study's aim, procedure, findings and conclusion again. Be ready to evaluate the study considering strengths like its practical design and limitations, such as the simplicity of the task compared to real world situations. And Willingham's learning theory. Be prepared to describe Willingham's key ideas and apply them to educational contexts, such as how his theory could inform effective teaching practices. Evaluation should include strengths like, like its practical applications and supporting evidence base as well as limitations. Finally, research methods. Make sure you embrace those across all the papers. Recognise that they come up in both exam papers, not just paper one. While paper one is where you'll find the main section on research methods, it's crucial to understand that they can and are examined across the entire course. So familiarise yourself with examples of research and identify key elements such as aims, hypotheses, 
variables, control measures, samples used, and data collected. Exposure to different research scenarios will better prepare you for the new piece of research you'll face in this section. Use resources such as our predictive papers and walkthroughs to strengthen your understanding and application of research methods, like we said before. Now let's move on to paper two. Now we know for paper two, social context and behavior, there are four sections in the paper. That's social influence, language thought and communication, brain and neuropsychology, and psychological problems. And we'll go through each of these topics in this video as well. So let's start with social influence, looking at things like factors affecting conformity to majority influence. Look at social factors, so ensure you understand how group size, anonymity, and task difficulty affect conformity. For example, larger groups tend to increase conformity, but anonymity can reduce it. Task difficulty also plays a role with individuals more likely to conform when they perceive a task as challenging. Then you've got dispositional factors. So also be familiar with how personality traits, such as whether someone is high or low in self-esteem and levels of expertise influence conformity. Those with higher self-esteem or more expertise are generally less likely to conform. So be prepared to evaluate these factors considering their strengths, like providing insights into why people conform in different situations and limitations, such as the difficulty of isolating individual factors from situational influences. Then you'll want to look at bystander behaviour, specifically looking at dispositional factors. So focus on how factors like similarity to the victim and personal expertise affect bystander intervention. For instance, people are more likely to help if they perceive a similarity with the victim or if they have relevant expertise. And then you'll want to look at Piliarvin's subway study, know the details of this study, including its aim, procedure and findings. This study investigated how factors like the victim's perceived state and the presence of other bystanders influenced helping behaviour. And then of course, be ready to evaluate that study considering its strengths, such as its real world settings, which enhances ecological validity and limitations like potential ethical issues and the generalizability of the findings to other settings. Next, we have crowd and collective behaviour. Social and dispositional factors, you want to look at understanding the social factors such as group dynamics and social norms and dispositional factors like individual personality traits that affect collective behaviour. You want to pay particular attention to how these factors can lead to different forms of collective behaviour in various settings. Then you want to look at de-individuation and this is a key concept so be prepared to describe how this, which involves losing self-awareness in groups, can lead to behaviour that is out of character. You'll want to evaluate this explanation, including its strengths, like explaining phenomena such as riots or mob behaviour and limitations, such as its reliance on lab settings, which may not reflect real world scenarios. Next section, language, thought and communication. So you'll want to look at here properties of human communication that are not present in animal communication. So you want to ensure that you understand how human communication involves the ability to plan and discuss future events, a feature not observed in animal communication. And you'll want to be prepared to explain how this capacity for abstract thinking and future planning differentiates human language from that of animals. You also want to look at body language here. Focus on how various aspects of body language, such as open and closed posture, postural echo and touch can be applied to real life situations. Be ready to describe here how open posture can convey openness and confidence, while closed posture might indicate discomfort or defensiveness. Understanding these will help in interpreting non-verbal cues in everyday interactions. Next, you'll want to look at evidence that non-verbal behaviour is innate. So review research involving neonates to understand evidence supporting the innateness of non-verbal behaviour. For example, studies on newborns' ability to imitate facial expressions can provide insights into the innate aspects of non-verbal communication. Be prepared to discuss how this evidence supports the arguments that certain non-verbal behaviours are hardwired rather than learned. A study you'll want to look at here is Yuki's study of emoticons. So make sure you are familiar with Yuki's study, which investigated how emoticons are used to convey emotions across different cultures. Understand the study's aim, procedure findings and conclusions. And this includes how emoticons can affect the interpretation of emotional content and the cultural differences observed. As with all the named studies in the specification, make sure you can evaluate the study too. And be prepared to present the strengths and limitations always. Now, another section of the paper, brain and neuropsychology, you want to look at the release and uptake of neurotransmitters. So ensure you're familiar with how neurotransmitters are released from neurons, bind to receptor sites and then undergo reuptake. Be prepared to describe neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and how their levels can influence mood and behaviour. This foundational knowledge is crucial for understanding various psychological and neurological conditions. 
For this section, you'll also want to look at understanding neurological damage. So focus on how different types of neurological damage, such as strokes or brain injuries, can affect motor abilities and behaviour. Understand how damage to specific brain regions can lead to deficits in movement, speech or cognitive functions. Then finally here, Penfield's study of the interpretive cortex. Make sure you can describe Penfield's work on the interpretive cortex, including his use of electrical stimulation to map brain functions. Be prepared to outline the AIM procedure findings and conclusions of his study, which helped establish the relationship between specific brain areas and sensory or motor functions. Evaluation of this study should include its strengths, such as providing a clear map of brain function, and its limitations, such as potential ethical concerns or the applicability of findings to broader populations. Now, the final part of this paper, psychological problems. We want to look at types of depression and understand the key differences between unipolar depression, characterised by persistent low mood and lack of interest in activities, and bipolar disorder, which involves alternating periods of depression and mania or hypermania. Be able to describe the symptoms, duration and impact of each type of depression. Additionally, differentiate these from normal sadness, which is a temporary emotional state rather than a clinical condition. You also want to look at ICD diagnostic criteria, so familiarise yourself with this criteria for depression. This includes recognising the essential features for diagnosis, such as duration, severity and the impact on daily functioning. Be prepared to apply these criteria in case studies or hypothetical scenarios to identify and distinguish between different types of depressive disorders. You'll also want to look at biological explanation of depression as well, so make sure you can explain biological theories of depression, such as neurotransmitter imbalances, so things like serotonin, genetic factors, and then brain structure abnormalities. You want to be clear about how these biological factors contribute to the development of persistence of depressive symptoms. Prepare to evaluate the biological explanation by discussing its strengths, such as the development of effective pharmacological treatments like SSRIs. Consider its limitations too, such as its reductionist nature and the lack of consideration for psychological and social factors. Be ready to discuss how these factors may interact with biological elements to influence mental health. And just last one on that section, increased challenges of modern living. Focus on how contemporary issues like economic hardship and social isolation impact mental health. Understand how these stresses can exacerbate mental health problems, potentially leading to higher rates of depression and anxiety. Be prepared to explain the mechanisms through which economic deprivation, such as financial stress and unemployment and social isolation, such as lack of social support, affect mental health. This might include discussing increased vulnerability to stress and reduced access to mental health resources. Evaluate the implications of these challenges for mental health services and support systems. Now, just as an overall message, you will still face research method questions in paper two. Don't forget, already said it, but just reminding you, we've made sure that a range of questions have been included in our predicted papers to help you prepare for this. So go check them out. Good luck with your exam and try your very best.